Hello, my name is Yvonne Kay, and I'm a program assistant for the Hopi Cooperative Extension Office on the Hopi Reservation in Northern Arizona. Welcome and thank you all for registering for How to Compost for a Thriving Garden. Our presenter tonight is Ms. Ellen Ryan of Flagstaff. Ms. Ryan has been involved in recycling for over 30 years. She was a conservation educator for the city of Flagstaff and developed a compost bin distribution program in 1996. Uh, she also developed the compost demonstration site and composting education program with Flagstaff Unified School District's New Start School. Um, in 2002, she received the Compost Facility Operator Training Certification at Washington State University, and she recently became a certified master gardener this past year. And here is Ms. Ryan for you. Okay, well, welcome to the composting class. We'll get started. And welcome to composting. I hope to inspire you to compost more or get you to begin composting. So thank you to Yvonne and Susan for allowing me to be part of the training program. So I started composting a long time ago in my family's gardens and later through um, working with the city of Flagstaff began as a compost educator, composting educator there and started the compost bin program for the city. Now this is a good definition of composting. It's the transformation of raw organic materials into a biologically stable humic substance suitable for a variety of soil plant uses. Now compost is anything organic. That means it was once living or is living now. And biologically stable means that you want this material to go into the soil to be useful for growing as a growing medium. The composting elements that you need to do the whole system, you need to have a method, you need to have the organic materials, you need to have oxygen, you need to have microorganisms, mass, heat, particle size, and water. All of these are necessary. And I will go through these today. So the first are the methods or the system. Now the top screen is a large composting system, probably for a municipality. And these are called windrows. The darker areas are the windrows of organic material. And they're being turned side to side as they um, complete a cycle of typically the heat that changes what the compost looks like at the time. So they'll rotate the windrow side to side until it's finished. The bottom picture is a system like that Northern Arizona University uses. So they will make piles, and right now they're quite large piles, and they'll turn them side to side also. So this is large scale composting. Many municipalities across the country use this. Now, some places have small bins, and that's okay. It takes all their organic material from their kitchen area and turns it into compost slowly. The Colton Community Garden uses a three bin active composting system with the material holding bin on the right. So on the first container on the left is where they would put the organic material and they would throw food waste in, coffee grounds, all sorts of organic materials and then cover with the leaves. The second bin is where they would turn the material into. And the third bin is a holding bin where compost matures. And this is a small tumbling bin at the Colton Community Garden on the grounds of Museum of Northern Arizona. And this is their holding bin. So it's kind of their final finishing just to let it settle. This is a bin that I use at home and one that I brought into the city to provide for city residents so they could purchase these bins. And this is a um, three foot by three foot by three foot container, which really is the minimum size that you need to get very active composting. So that's 27 cubic feet. The screen on the right is very useful. When your compost is finished, you still need to get out the larger parts like avocado pits. And this is in Flagstaff near a garden site near downtown. And the Terra Birds group 
has set up the system and they make it go from right to left. So they have holding material for leaves, but then they start their active composting and then they'll turn it to the left and then screen it on the very far left. So the screen is over, can be over a wheelbarrow. So they can actually screen the material out. So the samples of compost bins, there's a wire mesh, you can have slats, uh, concrete block or wooden pallets. And if you make these, make sure they're at least a cubic yard. So three feet by three feet by three feet. And of course, pile up as high as you can to get started to get the three feet high. Now, countertop containers, if you're doing home composting, it's good to be able to collect all your food waste in a container on your counter or under the counter. Some kitchens even have um, very large indoor containers if it's a school or municipal site somewhere, a bit larger building but it's good to have a closed container. So organic materials, pretty much, there's such a variety of organic materials you can use. You can use leaves, sawdust, uh, sticks from the yard, coffee grounds, newspaper, eggs, dryer lint, if it's mostly cotton clothing, produce, and then cuttings from the garden. Other materials, pine needles, grass clippings, uh, shredded paper, of course. And the goal is to get all those materials to decompose. Now there's one thing wrong with this picture. I see a large melon on the right. Materials should be chopped to be into smaller pieces. And you need to have them about two inches or smaller. And that's because the microorganisms that we need in compost need to have access and more surface area gives them better access. So the melon really won't decompose for a long time unless it's chopped up. Okay, the next thing is proper ratio for the carbon, for the composting materials, for the organic materials. We talk about the CN ratio. So carbon or nitrogen. Now I think you should have received the carbon nitrogen ratios by weight um, paper. And if you can refer to that. So every material has a ratio, carbon to nitrogen. The one in nitrogen, it's always one, but that doesn't mean it just has one part nitrogen to everything else. It could be I mean, it doesn't have 1%, but that is the relative scale to one. So let's see, pine needles, 80 to one is the ratio, but it may actually have 40 uh, parts carbon to half a part nitrogen. And then we always say 80 to one instead of 40 to a half as far as their makeup. Now, every material has both carbon and nitrogen. So we, we have to get it to a scale that works so we can balance the materials. And if the, if the amount of carbon is too high, then the composting process will not occur quickly. You need to have nitrogen in there to assist in the process. If the ratio is too low, you're likely to lose nitrogen as ammonia gas. So ideal, it's 25 to 40 to one. And that's the ratio that works best. And finished compost actually gets down to 10 to 15 to one because it's stable at that point. You need to have a good, a good balance of materials. So working with this list, you also need to know that uh, the, the chart, you need to have a dry weight count to actually make a proper recipe. But that's really too hard for any of us to figure out on a daily basis because we just add our produce to an already cooking compost bin. But when you start your system, try to start it full. Get the whole 27 cubic yards of material and put it together. And if you don't have the exact ratio, that's okay. You can adjust it as compost decomposes, as the material decomposes. So this is a, a proper recipe. And the way to do this, I think I also did hand out, have as a handout the recipe sheet 
If not, don't worry about it because it's just too complicated to do on a, on a regular basis. But we do the dry weight and the ratio is a percent of carbon or nitrogen in a material. So you can just figure out your own recipes. And basically, if you do one part nitrogen to maybe two to four parts carbon, then that gives you a good start and you can adjust. The next part of managing composting is to have enough oxygen and to have the microorganisms working. So microorganisms need to have, um, well, microorganisms are in different heat. We'll talk about that later, different heat zones. But if you, to introduce oxygen to a compost system, what I do is when I start to make my bin full, I might put sticks in the bottom and then I might um, throw in a layer of, uh, well, it has ground contact, so you need soil at the bottom. Throw in some sticks for aeration, so the bottom is aerated and then start to add material. You can layer leaves and then your produce and then some coffee grounds and, and grass clippings and keep layering everything until it's full. So in the beginning, you want to gather enough material to fill your bin. And then compost will need to be turned, which means just shoveling it side to side, or if you have a large bin, rotating it. But that allows the microorganisms to have oxygen to continue their process. Now the heat is an important component. And in large scale composting, if they're, say a university has a composting program for the food waste from their cafeterias, they need to make sure that they have the pathogens reduced or, or eliminated and that there are no critters that get to the compost during its process. So the vector attraction reduction for critters, if you have compost at 104 degrees for 14 days, that's successful. In an active decomposition, it, needs, it can go up to 150, 104 to 150 or over. So we talked about the microorganisms and there are microorganisms that work on the compost under 50 degrees. Even in the winter time, if it gets cold, it's fine inside, they're still working and your compost is probably not frozen. Now the mid range 50 to 113 is a pretty active type of um, compost temperature. So materials can break down in that temperature range and then you're also doing vector attraction reduction and active decomposition. Now the thermophilic range 113 to 155, that really cooks the compost and can further uh, reduce the pathogens. So these, all these temperature ranges work quite well to get composting, um, decomposing materials to decompose. Now the turning of compost, people say, um, when do I turn? How do I know when to turn? Should I do it once a week? Wait two weeks, wait a month? It really is temperature dependent. So if you don't have a thermometer, you won't really know the temperature. So if you turn it every four to seven days, that's probably sufficient. And you'll start to see the mass of the pile reduce as decomposition occurs. And water, 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 water. Water is very important to allow the microorganisms to be successful in the compost pile. If you have dry material, it will probably sit a long time without decomposing. So you do need microbial life in your bin to have things decompose. Now the factors affecting compost and are physical, biological, and chemical. So the physical part we've talked about, the moisture, the size of the particles, the pile structure, and composition, um, turning the compost and getting the density. So the biological part is aeration, oxygen, moisture, the temperature, you can get the pathogens going or reduce the pathogens and get the, the microorganisms going and then product stability. So carbon dioxide is, is off-gassed and ammonia 
and then the odor is controlled. So all of this biological, all of these biological events happen when you're making compost. So the chemical part of producing compost is the nutrient balance. So you want the carbon nitrogen ratio to work well. You want the pH to be where it should be. You wanna make sure the salts are okay. And you're not probably not going to test all this. This is just what happens in composting. So the composting process, you have materials, organic materials, you have water that you're adding to the pile. The gases are going off, oxygen's coming in. So everything's happening all at once. And you can either be a um, recycler and just let this occur. It'll take a longer time, or you can be an active composter and try to get all these elements right. So it's very important to get your method, your, all your methods going. Now finished compost, you need to have um, compost maturity and stability. And if you don't have finished compost uh, correctly at these stages, then it could inhibit growth in the stems and roots of plants. So we really wanna make sure compost is finished. So there's no more microbial action. It is cool to touch. It doesn't smell anymore. And you don't notice the bugs. There aren't worms still crawling. Well, there may be worms still crawling in, but mostly you won't see bugs. And to test this, all you have to do is bag it and wait a week and see if it smells. If it doesn't smell, it's not still continuing to compost. You need compost to be mature. So the biological fitness or completeness is very important. It won't affect plant growth. So the test for this is to grow radishes in soil that you've mixed compost in and they should grow quickly. You could also wait a while on that. If you wanna wait, several months and then use your compost later, and just let it sit, that's okay. It will be finished at that time. And the soil, you're adding compost to soil to build the soil and make it a better um, element for plants to grow in. So organic matter incorporation, the benefits to using compost is that you're returning nutrients to the soil. Now we can't say that compost is a fertilizer. It doesn't have the um, proper elements in the proper ratios to be an organic or to be a proper fertilizer, but it does have slow release nutrients that can act over time. You can add it every year and it improves the soil tilth or structure of the soil. So it has proper drainage and aeration both. So you want water to drain and you want oxygen to be in the soil. It can pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So they've actually tested that. And it can, it obviously replaces the chemical fertilizers. So protecting public health and water. Now, a lot of people can use compost too for weed erosion on banks or areas that have been burned. And that does reduce the erosion and promote or promote weed and erosion control, sorry. And then also reduce soil diseases and promote growth. Compost can increase the microbial activity in the soil. It can also suppress soil-borne diseases and plant pathogens and can immobilize and degrade pollutants. So there has been a lot of work and research on compost. So the goal is to add organic matter to our very soil <laughs> uh, depleted of organic matter, and that helps plants grow. Now, the uses of compost, you can add it to grass or turf. And if you add an inch in new turf, then that's sufficient, one inch on the top of all the material, and then plant grass seed or, or turf. In the garden, if you incorporate a half inch to one inch a year, that's sufficient. In established grass, just a little bit on the established grass every year. In landscaping, it can be used as mulch, but you have to keep it away from the tree trunks. And of course, we talked about soil 
reclamation at mine sites or fire sites or steep slopes in urban areas. It can reduce uh, dust, so people can just use it in a, a vacant lot to reduce dust. They've also used it for stormwater applications. To, uh, it's also, it uh, acts kind of like a filter for the water for runoff. And then of course for potting mediums, all these are good uses of compost. And then people also wanna know why, or how much do I need if I have a garden if I have 325 square foot garden, how much compost do I need? How much finished compost? And about half a cubic yard will do that. And we know that our compost bin is a yard. And if we keep adding material all year to that, we can have about a, a, yard, a half a yard to a yard of complete compost. Now it doesn't take a year to make compost if you get all these method, all the elements of these methods right. It can take a couple months if you're really actively composting. So these are different um, amounts that you would need for different applications. Now the volume of compost, if you have yard waste, one ton can yield one cubic yard of finished product. So it really does take quite a bit if you just have yard waste. And then compost does lose mass and volume in the process, but that's okay, you're always adding more material. But it does, when it decomposes, it does lose mass and volume. Compost tea is another thing you can make. And you have to be very careful with this because you don't want to um, ferment the compost. If you put material with water and let it sit and then drain the water off and use it, in a dilute method, the benefits of that are actually reducing mold and mildew on, on these crops. So people in greenhouses might use this method because they can control what they're doing and they will test the compost tea, but I don't really use that much. Vermicomposting is another way to compost. And this is different. These are red wiggler worms, not general earthworms. And it's done in a small bin. So you're, you're putting the worms with typically shredded newspaper and just adding food waste. And the worms will, will work on the food waste and then their castings or their manure is what is the compost. And it's very, very rich compost. You've probably seen it for sale in nurseries. So the big issues with composting are that decomposing organic material are the, in, in a landfill, they're the main cause of leachate and methane gas and other greenhouse gases. So the city of Flagstaff in, a, in their climate plan determined that 11% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions from the landfill <laughs> were um, a big problem. So it's time to address that. And if we compost the material, separate out the yard waste and the grass clippings and do something different, we won't have that uh, part of the greenhouse gas emission in our total emission. So what, what Flagstaff is doing is working with NAU, Northern Arizona University, to add their yard waste and grass clippings, or not yard waste, but grass clippings from the parks and the cemeteries and, and NAU does all of their grounds and takes their leaves and everything over there. And they might at this point be adding food waste from the cafeterias, but I'm not sure, not sure about that. But NAU is making large piles of compost and then using it on their grounds. So they're, they're revamping their compost program. So in landfills, between 25 and 40% of the landfill is, is comprised of organic material. So food, yard waste, and paper products that are not recycled. So it can be a large figure. Now there are many composting operations over the country and there's a group that puts out a magazine and does a lot of testing and reporting and it's called BioCycle, so they do have all these operations across the country report to them their statistics every year. 
So in 2017, there were 4,713 comp composting operations and yard waste with yard waste. So compost is what we need to make our gardens grow better, to make the plants be able to take up the nutrients in a sustained way and to reduce the amount of fertilizer that we're adding to the soil. There are many benefits to using compost in the soil. And if you have questions, you can contact me. This title came to me when I worked at the city of Flagstaff and you can email me or contact me through the cooperative extension. And I'll show you a video, hopefully. Let's see, check the chat, that's okay. Okay, I'll, I'm going to show a video. So this is one that was produced for the Master Gardener program in Flagstaff through the cooperative extension. That didn't happen. Sorry, let me go back to that. Okay, let's see if I can start this. I'm Ellen Ryan here teaching the composting course for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Training Program. And we're here at the Colton Community Garden. These are the three bins that they have set up to compost actively. They have some holding bins with leaves and another composting site by the garden. But this is the one we'll work with today. And they have it set up so you put your initial material in here and then move it over here and then the last one is the holding bin for finished compost. So in this first bin, they have put in some produce, um, broccoli stems, and then they did coffee grounds and onion, and they've covered it with leaves. So they always have leaves in the bin. So this typically just gets layered until they're ready to turn it. So you can see there's quite a bit of food in here. And one thing you should do when you compost is chop up materials. So instead of a whole onion, that really should be chopped. And then that allows the microbes to have more surface area to get to the material. And it looks like they have a good mix of green and brown. The green would be the food waste, the brown would be the leaves. And if it's not right, they'll come back and adjust the amounts. Now, when it goes to the second bin, you have material that looks mostly uh, very dark. It's been composting already. There are worms in here. It's cooler temperature on the top. It's 117 degrees in the bin right now. So this may or may not be ready to screen. I don't know when they last turned it. But in turning, what you're doing is just shoveling this material to this bin. That's the turning mechanism here and then they don't have anything in their finished bin. But I'll show you how to screen material. And this is a commercially made screen. You can also use something that you've made at home just with two by four and wire mesh and just make it large enough to sit over a wheelbarrow. So to screen, you'll just shovel material on top of the screen and push it through because you don't want all these woody parts in your garden they'll rob the uh, plants and the roots of nitrogen so you can see how much big material is going to stay on the top and the worms can go in they can go in the finished bin and continue but it's simply screen your material. This material is nice and wet. And then what you have in the bottom is a finer 
material. Now that's that's very moist. That might be about 50% moisture, but but it's not bad. Squeezing the worms, but it's not bad. That's that's a good moisture for compost to keep happening for the de decomposition process to keep happening. So that's screening of the material. Now, when you after you chop up your produce and you add the ground material, you really should cover that to keep the, the flies out and keep the pests from coming. But you want the microbes and the worms and other pests to be in the material. So you don't need to cover it too much. And then when you have this material, you might want to get layers of newspaper or burlap to keep it moist. So that's why this pen was really wet. And then when it goes to the third one, you might want to cover it with a, a tarp just to keep it and let it finish. So there's nothing in that bin yet, but they are working actively. Now these bins are, I mean, it looks about three feet by three feet by three feet. And that's perfect. That's one cubic yard. And when they fill this, it'll have the mass that it needs to develop the heat and keep it composting. If this were a bigger mass, it might be warmer than the 117 or 118. Well, I walk it out to my compost bin, and my compost bin is, is exactly the same as this. This is what the city of Flagstaff would sell. So this is an earth machine. So I will show you how to turn your material, which really means shoveling it side to side. And rather than a three bin system, this is a conical bin. So you can just lift it up, move it over, and ground contact is perfect. You want the worms to come up and the microbes to come up. So this material is not a huge amount of material. And I do recommend starting your bin full so you have the mass so that it can start cooking right away. So this, I'm going to add material to it when I fill the new bin. So side to side, you'll be turning it. Now this is a very cold, because it doesn't have the mass. in my food scraps and coffee grounds and paper towel from the kitchen. And this would be the time to introduce some water because you really want this moist. This is dry now with all of the leaves in it. And then I would just keep shoveling it side to side. So this is introducing air. And the microbes have a better place to live. And I won't fill the whole bin, but even if I moved all of this over, it would probably only fill a third of the bin. And it would maintain a cool temperature. It would not be hot enough to continue to really cook and compost well. So this needs to have a lot more material put in initially. And then over the winter, I would just continue to add produce and it'll keep composting. It will decrease in size as it decomposes. And don't worry about freezing in the wintertime. You don't have to turn it if it's too cold. Just let it sit. And then in the spring, when you turn it, you'll find out that a lot of the parts have broken down. The cell structure will break down. So that's it for turning the compost.
I have a question. So I'm I live in Gilbert, and which is a very different climate from Flagstaff. Okay. And vermiposting sounds interesting. I'm afraid that the worms would die here in the heat. Well, the the um, worm composting is pretty much an inside system. So it's okay. in a, it's in a Rubbermaid container that may be a foot by two feet by eight inches tall. And okay. you set up the bin with screen holes on the side and put in newspaper and the red wigglers, which you order online, and then you can put it in the garage and keep adding produce. So it's My not- My garage even... gets pretty hot too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep them in the back room when I have a bin running. So okay. they stay inside my house. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's a possibility. All right. Mm -hmm. um, looking, also being in, in a city lot in, this, uh, in Gilbert, I don't have any grass. I've got a lot of trees, but okay. I, you know, um, yard debris um, is grinding up palm fronds. Can that work for yard debris if I try to grind those up so they're not so large? That can work. However, they are uh, a very um, fibrous material. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to get a mix of other materials. Um, I call this just going out and gathering. Brewery, um, if there's a brewery in town, they'd be happy to give you brewery waste. If you, okay, they're doing flag stuff anyway. If I take a five gallon bucket in, they'll fill that next time they empty the vat. I can ask neighbors if I can pick up their bagged leaves that they sit at the curb. I can see if there's a neighbor that cuts their grass and see if the grass doesn't have chemicals on it and then pick up the bagged grass at the, at the curb. So you can okay. gather, gather materials, um, just look around from the materials suitable for composting sheet just look at that whole list and see where you think you might find those materials. Okay. Does somebody have a horse stable nearby. Uh, there's manure and the straw, which is very good for composting. And then you just add your produce to it. So there are many materials on here that you, you can gather. Review those materials on the list and then look at the carbon nitrogen ratios to try to get a balance of green and brown. Okay. And then one thing with home composting is that you don't want to add meat or oil or fats because it is hard to get the bin or the whatever method you're doing. It's hard to get the heat high enough to actually kill the pathogens that might come in with those. Okay, any other questions? Pam is asking if, um, or she said that she thought citrus was not good for worms. Okay, good. Yeah, citrus and salts are not very good for worms. Yeah, pretty much everything else. They like a lot of bananas and um, mushier fruit and mushier vegetables, easy to eat lettuces and carrot peelings are fine, but you might see them there weeks later. So they digest at a slower rate. So after watching the video, I realized that I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. My name's Valerie. Um, <laughs> And I realized that after you, I saw your video with those tumblers, those um, black uh, tumblers that you can turn yeah. uh, for the composting, I realized I'm using that all wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> because you said that uh, on the video, you said that's kind of more for the more finished product. Mm -hmm. And and so I've been, I was dumping like already the food waste directly into there and it was taking forever to to break down and I was I was having trouble with it and it was getting stuck and I was getting frustrated so I quit using it but now I realize I I need it for the finished product so I'll be moving some of the what I have in there and trying it again good good yeah yeah they're so small and the air airspace around it is so large and then you turn it and you're actually introducing more air and it dries out yes and then clumps mm -hmm. yeah it, it got pretty frustrating <laughs> <laughs> the um the thing about all those elements that i talked about in the beginning if they're all optimum then it will compost faster but if you don't 
want to turn your pile for three or four weeks, then it just takes a little longer. And the comment about water, you could use water from, you know, I've even taken buckets from the shower out to my compost or pasta water that has been drained off. Mm -hmm. uh, think of other places that we dump water when we shouldn't be, we should be adding it to the compost bin. So it's not, don't just use you know, fresh water on it, there are other sources. And then you okay. can always add very wet materials to kind of kickstart it when you turn it. Okay. So grass clippings or things like brewery waste, which we have in Flagstaff and other things that are just very, very wet and then turn it and then watch it and it'll hold the moisture for a while. So anything okay. on that carbon nitrogen sheet that was high in carbon, I always okay. keep a, a bin of leaves, but it can be anything on that sheet if you can find it okay. or, or go to a community that has bagged up leaves in the fall and grab some for the winter time. My question, other question was, um, I'm getting two different, um, not, I don't know if they're answers or comments, but um, in the worm bin, we've been putting in like slices of apples. And I was told that would help to um, almost like arouse them and they have more babies. And then, um, then another comment was, you don't put apples in there at mm -hmm. all. And so I'm like, okay, which one do I do? Do I not put apples in there or do I continue putting apples in there? That was another question. Well, that's, I've never heard the arouse question, <laughs> the arouse answer, but I, I think <laughs> slicing up apples because again, they're a harder um, fruit, not very hard, but a little bit harder. So thin, thin slices might be able to decompose quicker. And the trick is if you put something in and you wait a week or two and you look and you see if it's still there, they probably don't want that or, or they're getting other material that they like better. So if things are there in the bin and they're not being, they're not decomposing or they're not being acted on by the worms through their eating the, worm, the um, product, then you, you might wanna take it out or not add so much. Yeah, and they also need some eggshells that helps a little bit with digestion, um, I, I've experimented and put in quite a few things. So I think just keep experimenting and see what works. Okay, I, I, I do have some eggshells. I'll just throw those in there also, thanks. Yeah, grind those up, you're welcome. And then back to the, the branches in the bottom of the bin, that's really when you first set up your compost bin and you want the full mast, whatever system you have, of three feet by three feet by three feet. And that just helps bring in oxygen from the bottom. But then when you turn it, you don't need to put more things in there because you have decomposed material, which typically has more airspace around it than your fresh uh, produce that you're putting in or garden scraps or, yeah, it is, it's helpful to have something to just turn side to side if you have a lot of material. And uh -huh. then keep going, just keep it going and turning it as fast as you can. And that is the key to getting more oxygen in there and adding water and keep turning so things are mixed. Mm -hmm. So that's a okay. fast one. Mm -hmm. One thing I did hear about or, or that, I, that I know about apple seeds, they contain traces of cyanide in them. Okay. So that's, that's why she takes the seeds out. I think she still still give them the apple uh, peelings and the parts of the apple, the meat and everything, but um, I think she takes the seeds out. That's the only thing that she doesn't um, really give to any of her animals is the apple seeds, just because of that, that they contain traces of um, cyanide, in, uh, small traces. But of course, if you eat them, um, I'm sure it'll build up. So that's the only thing that I've ever heard about um, apples. So Right. And, and I wasn't thinking about the seeds at all, because I just, I wouldn't put any seed into the worm bin because it might start to sprout. I mean, if you think of a, a, a fast sprouting seed would be an issue. So I just, I didn't even think about that, but that's true, keep out the seeds. Well, thank, thank you all. And, and thank you very much for your interest in composting. And but I'm glad you got to learn a little bit and, and keep composting. We really, really appreciate your time, Ms. Ryan. Thank you so sure. much.
doing this problem. Happy to do it and happy to help in the future. So thank you.